Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming out and spending a bit of extra time this afternoon here with me. I am Aaron Siegel, the scholar in residence with Upper Baltimore. It is my pleasure to be here on this most special of performance occasions because, as many of you probably know, this run of performances marks the 15th anniversary of Upper Baltimore. A decade and a half of existence. And so one of the things that I want to do with my time today is to delve into that legacy. I set for myself the task of what happens if I take the same musicological toolbox that I use when researching Mozart's Der Schauspiel Director or Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin, for instance, and turn that kind of attention onto this company itself. And so the story that I want to tell today is the story of how it is that then Baltimore Concert Opera, now Opera Baltimore, comes into existence. One of the things that is so very striking about the early emergence of this company is that a number of the fundamental aspects of what this company was trying to do are still absolutely core to the mission of the organization today. And so it's there, there is a long-term cohesiveness there in the goals of this company. So I offer today's talk as a celebration of that very auspicious legacy in honor of 15 years and in hopes of the next 15 to come. Here's where we're going to start. We'll go back to the Great Recession of 2008-2009. So we'll start way out here and build it up from there, all right? This was, of course, a terrible financial time for people's retirement accounts, for the hiring market for job seekers, for people's stock portfolios, and especially a terrible time for arts organizations that are so dependent upon philanthropic support for their survival. For opera in particular, this was a frightening time. To give you some examples, Opera companies are closing, shrinking, laying off people, cutting back on plans. And so some notable ones from around this time period. November 2008, Opera Pacific, a long-running company in Orange County, California, closes completely. February 2009, Connecticut Opera in Hartford closes down completely. Even the big top-tier companies like Los Angeles Opera, laying off many of their workers, Metropolitan Opera, enforcing pay cuts upon their staff, orchestra, the chorus, the production staff, etc. Closer to home here, Washington National Opera had planned to produce a rain cycle, but given the expense of that undertaking, they pulled the plug on the whole thing. Here at home, perhaps some of you were longtime attendees of the Baltimore Opera Company, and so I suspect there are people here who know this story better than I do because it affected you. The Baltimore Opera Company had been in business since 1950, but its origins go back even longer than that, back to the 1920s as Baltimore Civic Opera, when it was largely a community undertaking. In December of 2008, they put on a performance of Bellini's Norma, which would ultimately be their last performance. That same month, they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Soon thereafter, in March of 2009, they entered Chapter 7 liquidation, and the story for that company came to a complete end. They were, after all, carrying a $1.2 million <coughs> debt, and the sort of greatest shame of it all was that in May 2009, all of their properties entered public auction and were sold off. So costumes, sets, score library, everything gone. Even ticket holders were stiffed. And again, perhaps there are some of you who were amongst that crowd. Ticket holders, subscribers were left <coughs> unrefunded with tickets for an upcoming <coughs> Rossini, Barber of Seville, and an upcoming Gershwin Porgy and Zess. And of course, we should not forget that all the employees of that company finally, or rather suddenly, found themselves without work. Now, as a musicological researcher, 
I turn my attention to the same kinds of sources that I would if I were researching you know, Tchaikovsky or Rossini. And so I looked at the primary sources, I looked at the newspaper accounts, only here it's close at hand and near at home. I acknowledge that I may be ending up quoting people that you know. Maybe I'm even quoting you, who knows? We'll see where it goes. So let me start with this quote. March 2009, the Baltimore Sun, of course, closely covered the closure of Baltimore Opera Company. And the Baltimore Sun in March 2009 interviewed a production stage manager named Jeffrey Woodward. He said this to the paper, quote, we all knew in November that this was going to be the ultimate outcome, meaning eventual closure and selling off the properties. It put a lot of people's lives on hold while they talked about coming back, which was just a pipe dream. They were just spinning wheels as far as we can tell. So to understand this scene, we need to think of all of these opera professionals who thought they had a season of work ahead of them. Baltimore Opera Company employed a chorus, employed their own orchestra, plus all the people who were cast for it, plus all the production team, etc. So their lives were all put on hold. The hit was felt by patrons too. Here, a letter to the editor to the Baltimore Sun written in March 2009. Now this is of course when like the newspaper business was a better thing than it is today. And so if you had something to say, writing a letter to the editor of the Baltimore Sun was a good way to get it heard. So here's Marianne Traeger, contributing editor to Style Magazine, writing this in March 2009. She writes, quote, the news stung, an old friend had died and I never said goodbye. I assumed she'd always be there for me, but the Baltimore Opera is gone yet another casualty of the economic morass. I can wag a finger at corporate sponsors and major donors, but my laissez-faire attitude also contributed to the final curtain. I should have gone to more performances. I could have bought season tickets. Had I known that the illness was terminal, I would have been more attentive. Too often, perhaps, I favored Washington or New York for their grander productions, but it's too late now. The fat lady has sung her last aria. Now, with the closure of Baltimore Opera Company, there were still other ongoing ventures in this city. Again, perhaps some that you yourselves attended back then. A company called Opera Vivente, for instance, was begun back in 1998. Small scale company, but they did fully stage modern productions, all sung in English. That was their chief attribute. But even they did not escape the economic challenges of the Great Recession. They ended up canceling their 2011-2012 season after having planned it and sold subscriptions for it and so on as well. Likewise, an outfit called American Opera Theater, whose origins go back to 2003. In their productions, they strove, in their own words, to be, quote, innovative and, quote, unusual, both in terms of the repertory they produced and the style of production that they put on. They too only made it as far as early 2011, leaving a planned season also unperformed. From Mark Skorka, who at the time was president and CEO of Opera America, an organization that is still one of the leading industry advocates for opera in this country, Mark Skorka had this to say, again quoting him from a Baltimore Sun article. Around the time of all of these closures, March 2009, he wrote this. It is inconceivable that Baltimore <coughs> would give up its incredible tradition of opera and not have an important opera company. I don't believe the city will stand for not having an important opera company. <laughs> there was a recognition that clearly there is a demand for this art form in this place. And in a response to that demand, one of the outfits that rises up to meet it, and also, of course, to put to work many of the opera professionals who found themselves suddenly out of work, was none other than our very own Baltimore Concert Opera. Founded in January of 2009 by a baritone who had spent a decade singing with the Baltimore Opera Company, none other than Brendan Cook. He was, at the time, general director and artistic director of this new venture. Started with a board of just six members, including our very own now artistic director, Julia Cook. The company, by the way, has always been based 
where we are right now at the Engineers Club. After incorporating in January, by March 25th of 2009, think of how fast that turnaround is, less than two months, they are ready for their first production and their first performances. Initially, the undertaking seemed almost more like a stopgap effort, just something to keep people working until Baltimore Opera Company might come back. For instance, Brendan Cook told this to the Baltimore Examiner. You remember that newspaper? It doesn't exist anymore. It's sort of the story here. All these things no longer exist. Brendan Cook told this to the Baltimore Examiner in February of 2009. So as their first production is planned, and as they're trying to get an audience to show out for it, Cook said this, quote, we hope that when companies like Baltimore Opera open their doors again, we will have helped cultivate a new fan base for this wonderful art form. Notice that this goal of attracting a new audience is still a very much a part of what Baltimore Opera Company, or rather, now Opera Baltimore, so many words that are all the same, right? <laughs> the goal of attracting a new audience is so much a part of what opera is all about. Think about the educational outreach initiatives of this company. Think about the ways in which Opera Baltimore tries to get opera heard in settings that we might not normally expect it. So from the beginning, the goal was for informality, accessibility, and sustainability of performance. And perhaps this is not necessarily the most um, informal and accessible space. <laughs> There's also a goal to demystify opera. One of the interesting early undertakings of the company was as they were seeking to cast works, they sold tickets so that you could come to open call casting auditions. Something like the kind of you know, um, reality TV shows that we see now where you always see the casting of the contestants. But again, the goal is to make it so that opera might be something that we can understand. Something that is not this elite out of reach, prestigious art form, but one that can be very tangibly comprehensible to an audience. <coughs> this has important resonances with the show that we are here to see today. Mozart's Der Schauspiel Director in German, the impresario in English, of course, is an opera about how an opera company is formed and how they go about putting on shows. So very core to the belief of this company. Another starting point for Baltimore Concert Opera is, of course, right there in the name, the idea of performing concert opera in the most traditional sense of the definition. Concert opera means that it is performed without sets, without costumes, accompanied by piano only, most generally. Oftentimes, singers even at a music stand with music in front of them. This too, though, has an important goal. As Brendan Cook explained to Baltimore Style Magazine, and here we'll jump ahead to May 2010 for these quotes. Cook told this to Baltimore Style. He says, quote, I realize that the opera business is going in the wrong direction. It's becoming very visually oriented and taking away from the vocal ability that makes it great. We've tried to make the vocal product more accessible and we've attracted a lot of curious people. Finding people that have come for the first time and then take the initiative to come back, that's the most rewarding thing for me. We encourage you to grab your drinks, bring them in, and ask questions. That one's still present, too. Please, visit the bar, bring a drink in to the show if you wish. Now, again, concert opera, what is special and unique about that? Once more, quoting Brendan Cook from the Baltimore Sun, October 2010, he says this, I think one of the gains in concert opera is a level of intimacy with the performers. For already existing fans, it's a chance to hear the piece in a different way. For others, it might be a gateway drug into opera. <laughs> you can look at our subscriber roll and see that this, in fact, really works. People do come here for the first time and stick around. So let's think about this gain in the level of intimacy. And to fully understand that, we really need to make a comparison between the kind of opera that will be performed in that room to my right versus the kind of opera that you experience if you go to, say, the Met or Chicago Lyric Opera or something like that. These are gigantically cavernous spaces. 
the chance for you as a patron to sit close enough to be able to really read the facial expressions on the singers is not all that likely, unless you've shelled out quite substantial sums of money. You may need binoculars to be able to see things up close. It is a kind of singing, too, that is of different expressiveness than what our singers can do here. The type of vocal projection necessary to fill up a hall as large as where Chicago Lyric Opera performs or at the New York Met is very different than the kind of singing where you're only needing to reach your furthest audience member of 50 yards, say, like that space is. So this gain in intimacy is a core element here. Also, the ability to focus more clearly on the nature and beauty of the human voice. Instead of vocalists needing to fight with, in many cases, such a large orchestra, the piano alone makes that kind of direct communication a more heightened experience. And for those of you that heard me talk about Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin, you will remember I made the argument uh, a month and a half ago that, in fact, this kind of setting is very true and appropriate for composers in terms of the gains of intimacy of expression. So those are the ideas that were sort of the kernel of what becomes now Opera Baltimore. In that first season, they produced initially Don Giovanni. That was the first ever production, March 25th, 2009, conducted by Anthony Barese, a conductor who has remained a very close collaborator, conducting other shows for us. That opening season, the company also prevented, presented a show called A Flight of Puccini. It was three individual acts from three different Puccini operas, so a good taster menu to sort of build up the audience's enthusiasm for coming back to see more full-length operas. There were striking predictions for the future from music critics at the time. March 2009, quoting here Tim Smith, formerly music critic of the Baltimore Sun. He wrote, quote, it may well be that a new full-scale company will emerge, possibly with its roots in the Baltimore Concert Opera. It is, of course, the growth of this company, eventually leading to our current ability to put on fully staged shows with orchestra at Towson University Stevens Hall Theater, that the name change was prompted to Opera Baltimore. So the critic got that one right. <coughs> Excuse me. Likewise, a letter to the editor from a writer named John Wright, writing to the Baltimore Sun in March 2009, urging readers to, quote, please note also that opera is not dead in Baltimore. Out of the ashes of the Baltimore opera, a phoenix has now risen. The Baltimore Concert Opera, a new venture in opera programming, the BCO should not be ignored. Rather, it could very well be the heir to Baltimore opera. So, a moment of congratulations for the fact that this company has made it this far. After that first season, or rather that first mini season of just two shows put on hastily in a spring within months of the incorporation, Opera Baltimore is, okay, Baltimore Concert Opera, <laughs> is back for a full 2009-2010 season. It included a recital of Verdi arias put on as part of Artscape, so further <laughs> evidence of this urge from the company to try to get opera into places where one does not normally encounter it. Also in that first season, fun fact, the current artistic director, Julia Cook, starred as the role of Marguerite in Gounod's Faust, so it's always been important at the heart of this company is that it is, of course, putting on professional singers on the stage, but also being run by people who have that background of themselves appearing on stage. In 2012, um, Julia Cook then becomes the executive director when Brendan Cook, the founder, takes the job as artistic director of Opera Delaware. Other additions to the output of this company in the 2015-2016 season, that is when Opera Baltimore began offering their Thirsty Thursday series. 
a much more informal way to experience opera singing. And I might even peg a bit of my own contributions here in this legacy. Um, a virtual class series was begun in the midst of COVID shutdown when performances were not possible, but we could at least still come to you to talk about opera. And my first involvement comes in February of 2021 with the earliest series of classes that I taught over Zoom. So, as I've said, we sit in this rather palatial venue, but with the advantage of the closeness that it brings us to the singers. And so again, I'll go back to the primary sources, take us back to May 2009. This is after the first full season of Baltimore Concert Opera Productions. The music critic for the Baltimore Examiner has this to say. The writer's name is Matt Calvarese. He writes, quote, it's wonderful that this room is being used for its intended purpose, meaning that concert hall where you will travel to as soon as my talk is over. It's wonderful that this room is being used for its intended purpose, and ticket holders will instantly realize its merit. The voices are so clear, the size of the room gives viewers the sense that they are experiencing a private performance of a very traditional art form. The performance itself was theatrical, albeit stationary. The players were very skilled at invoking emotion through their inflection, facial expressions, and small gestures, that is to say all the things that you can see here that are very difficult to see in many other venues that opera has performed. Once again, the size of the room, he writes, facilitated these skills. The beautiful and effective surroundings of the Garrett Jacobs Mansion, with all of its history and glamour, added a completely different element to concert opera, which seemed to suggest that this is how it was originally intended to be experienced. We should note that Mozart's The Impresario was just like we shall experience it today, originally produced in a long, narrow room with a relatively small stage set up at one end of the room that audience members had all dined on a very sumptuous meal prior to the performance of the opera. And so in fact, the space and layout of where you will witness this Mozart work is of perfect historical authenticity. And it is so striking for me as a music historian to look back and see a music critic writing in May 2009 in such a precise and prescient mode of describing what it is that makes the performances of this company so special and so unique. So let me break a brief report on the repertory of Opera Baltimore after 15 years of its existence. <coughs> the data says this. This has been a company that has prioritized Italian language opera. 36 of its productions have been Italian operas. But English is the second most frequently sung language here, with nine operas, followed by French at seven, German at just two, and Russian, Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin, the last production being the only time that language has made an appearance. With Italian being so predominant, perhaps it is no surprise that the leading composers in the company's repertory are Verdi with nine works, Puccini with eight, Rossini with six, Mozart with five, and Donizetti with four, all very much at the core of the Italian language opera repertory. <laughs> but we should not let this focus on the core repertory obscure the fact that additionally, Opera Baltimore has often prioritized less common repertory. So upon perusing the list, one finds works like Philippe's Lachme, Puccini's Edgar, a very early opera from Puccini's output, not at all a part of the canon. From Rossini, works like Semiramide, Tancredi, Guillaume Tell. From Mascagni, not just the common Cavalleria Aristocana, but also the much less common L'Amico Fritz. From Chilea, Adriana Le Courbure. And even American opera, as is appropriate for an American opera company like this, has received a good deal of exposure. Six works in Opera Baltimore's repertory are American. Michael Ching's Woso's Ghost, Carlisle Floyd's Susanna, Giancarlo Minotti's The Consul and The Medium, also Stephen Sondheim's Sweeney Todd, and Derek Wang's Scalia Ginsburg. Six American works. There's one other quite unusual production that deserves specific mention. And that is a production of an opera that had never been heard 
publicly for over 143 years until revived by Opera Baltimore. Perhaps some of you were in attendance at a 2014 production in October of that year, the modern debut of Franco Faccio's opera, Amadejo, that is to say, Shakespeare's Hamlet, set as an Italian opera. Faccio was an aspiring opera composer. He only ever wrote two works because he realized, frankly, that he was outclassed by his contemporary Giuseppe Verdi. And so he shifted his focus away from opera, letting Amleto linger in a drawer, unremembered, turned his attention instead to conducting, where he went on to conduct the premieres of Verdi's Aida and Otello, so someone who is very much at the core of Italian opera history. But not until 2003 did the conductor, Anthony Barese, begin work on a critical edition from the composer's manuscript, working with what is apparently a very difficult to decipher handwriting, ultimately getting a full score in parts and a piano vocal score ready for production. As this opera was headed to its staged premiere that took place at Opera Southwest in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the same cast of that stage premiere first sang it here in concert form in Baltimore. So this is sort of one of our, our great little footnotes in operatic history, because since those initial productions, Amleto has gone on to be recorded commercially. You can even get a Blu-ray disc of a production from the Bregrenz Festival. So it's made it into the repertory, and all of that process started right here. So it is quite a remarkable and notable history of 15 years, is my conclusion there. With the few minutes that we've got left, let me say a few words about the production that we are here to see today. I'm sure that many of you have watched or joined me on Zoom for my talks that led up to this. If you've not, you can of course always go to Opera Baltimore's website, find my webpage, Opera Insights, where the recordings of my previous talks are, where I have said two hours worth about the history of this Mozart work and where it comes from. So here's the short, short version. In Vienna, the Habsburg Emperor at the time is funding two different opera companies, one that sings in Italian, one that sings in German. He's got some family in town for a visit, and he decides to put on a special entertainment where he will showcase his two personally funded opera companies. He commissions from Mozart a German language, play with songs. He commissions from Antonio Salieri a one-act Italian language opera. Both of these works will be comedic takes on what it is like to make an opera. Mozart's work, the plot in a nutshell, is how do we form an opera company and hire the singers who will be a member of our company. Salieri's work is largely an argument between a composer and a librettist about actually creating the opera itself. At the time, the audience seemed to prefer Salieri's work to Mozart. And it seems that a lot of that had to do with the fact that Mozart's work was, as I said, largely a play with songs. It is only 24 minutes worth of music that Mozart originally wrote for that, with approximately an hour worth of dialogue. This is not exactly what we'll do for us today. And thus, in honor of this special anniversary, the decision was made by the board that Mozart's The Impresario would be the perfect work to present, but it needed to be presented in a very unique, original, and distinctive way. So the Impresario that you will hear today is, yes, absolutely true to Mozart's intentions. All of the music is there. But the spoken dialogue portion is an entirely newly written text, one that seeks to link up with those core elements of Opera Baltimore's DNA as a company, making it clear to you how it is that operas are made, that singers are cast, all, of course, from a humorous and satirical perspective. There will be stories that are very true. There will be jokes that are very funny. Again, all of Mozart's music is there, in addition to some extra interpolated arias, some from Mozart, some from other places. I won't seek to spoil any surprises there. Know that you are here for a very special and a very remarkable production 
put on by a top quality cast of committed actors and committed singers, performed in a venue that, as we have said, is perfect for this kind of work. A vision that is true to Mozart, but also unique to our circumstances and perfectly conceived for our times today. So I wish you a wonderful afternoon at the opera. Thank you for being part of these first 15 years of Opera Baltimore's history, and I look forward to seeing you in the years to come. Thank you very much.